floors. Uh, so, so great to have you this morning in with me. My name is Cynthia and I am part of our education department here at the aquarium. And this is a very special week because it is our summer kids club. So throughout this entire week at 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and 11 a.m., we will be offering our summer kids club program. So we are the group known as the Curious Crabs. And today, all of us, all of us curious crabs are going to be learning about the coral reef. We'll be making observations, talking about coral, what even is coral, how animals use coral, and also taking a closer look at some of the animals that you can find living within these different reefs all around the world. Um, so if today during this program you do have any questions, any observations, any thoughts that you want to share with us, we do have a live text line that you can use. And that live text line is right here on the screen. That number is 562-286-1838. So you can text in those questions in real time. You can share your observations with us in real time, and I really encourage you all to do so. Like that, I can talk about the things that you're interested in, and I can answer those questions. Maybe we can even take a look at some of your favorite animals. Uh, so feel free to use this text sign with your guardian's permission. If you are watching this program after it airs live, so after August 2nd, after around 11.30 a.m., you can still send in your questions and observations, but instead of using this live text line, you're going to want to use our email, and our email is live at lbaop.org. This just helps us ensure that we can get to your questions and observations um, in enough time since we're not always at this live text line. Um, so if you are watching after it airs live, use this email, but if you're watching this morning here with me right now, you're going to want to use this text sign right here. Uh, so like I mentioned, today we're going to be talking about coral reefs. Um, so what animals live in there, what is coral, lots of different things to think about. So to warm up our scientists' brains today, I'm going to go ahead and move off of the camera, and I just want you to make some observations. What are some things you notice about this coral reef that we're looking at? This is an exhibit that we have here at the aquarium, which is our big tropical exhibit. Um, so we have around a thousand animals that live within this exhibit, within this coral reef. So I'm just going to give you about 30 seconds or so for you to just think and observe. And if you want, you can share those observations with me. You can write them down. If you're watching this with someone, you can let them know. If you have a dog, a cat, a plant, you can talk to them. Um, but whatever you need to do to get your brain warmed up, just start to make some observations. I am still here. I am just going to sit here quietly for 20 seconds for you to be able to think and explore. So what are some things you were able to notice? Is there anything that caught your attention? I know for me, whenever I look at this exhibit, the animals kind of take my attention, right? You can see there's lots of different types of animals though, right? You can see one of our eagle rays right here. Um, he is a very, very beautiful ray. We have all different types of tropical fish in here, from some that have stripes, other ones that look like they have noses, if you notice our unicorn things, um, to other ones that might be even so small you don't even get the chance to see. You might have noticed earlier our zebra shark swam on by. Ooh, we have our bonnet head shark right here. So this just gives you an idea as to how diverse coral reefs are, right? Because out in the ocean, coral reefs are like underwater cities. They're bustling. There's so many animals in these coral reefs, and there's so many different types as well. One of my favorite facts about coral reefs, which, give you, which gives me an idea and would give you an idea as to how diverse and as to how important coral reefs are, is that coral reefs cover about less than 1% of the entire ocean floor. So think about how much of our planet Earth is covered in ocean. The majority of it is. But less than 1% of that entire ocean is coral reef. However, even though it's about less than 1%, it hosts around 25% of marine life. So 25% of all the ocean animals that are living out in the ocean, they're living within that 1% of those coral reefs. Do you see that comparison? 25% of animals living in 1% of these coral reefs out there. That's a super, super large gap, but these animals depend on coral reefs. So one thing I want you to get in the mindset of as we do our program today, as we talked about different things, I want you to start thinking about why are coral reefs so important? 
how can we protect coral reefs? Because we will be talking about that towards the end of the program is how can we help coral reefs um, and protect them? Because protecting them means we're protecting and helping the animals that depend on these coral reefs as well. So different little things to kind of go on in our minds right now, different things to think about. But I want to start off with the basics is what even is coral? If we're going to talk about what coral, why coral is important, we have to figure out what coral even is. Hmm, do you know what it is? You can text us um, if you want. You can text in your answer. But I'll give you three options. Do you think coral is an animal? Do you think coral is a plant? Or do you think coral is maybe a rock? Or I'll give you a fourth one, none of the above. Hmm. I'll give you 15 seconds to lock in your answer. Is it an animal, a plant, or a rock, or none of the above? Let's see if we can get a closer look at coral as well, and maybe that can help you in uh, trying to eliminate some of those potential answers. Ooh, this is a really nice close-up of some coral that you can see. Maybe it reminds you of a different animal. Or maybe it reminds you of a plant. I kind of gave the answer. Um, so, coral, are you ready? Are you ready to know what the answer is? The answer is, it's an animal. So coral is an animal. Does it look different from the animals that you're used to? So let's say if we were to compare coral to a dolphin, does it look the same as a dolphin? No. Does coral look the same as a turtle? Oh, we can't really see the turtle because of my green screen. Let's try a different animal. Does it look the same as a sea lion? No, it looks really similar to sea anemones, maybe to even jellies, you would say. And that's because they're part of that same family. They're related to anemones and they're related to jellies. And they belong to that group of animals. And they are also an animal themselves. And this close-up that you're looking at right now, you're looking at all the individual little coral polyps. So corals aren't just one giant animal. There's lots of little tiny animals that live all together. And another really special thing about coral is a type of algae that lives inside of it. And that algae is known as zooxanthellae. Did you, have you heard that word before, zooxanthellae? Let me write it down for us and we can get a nice little visual of it right now. So, let's see. I'm here just writing. I also want to make sure I'm not writing it wrong. So I'm going to double check with my friend Morgan and make sure my spelling is right. <laughs> We're gonna tell me yes. So here we go. This is our word, zooxanthellae. I love having visuals of words because I'm a very visual learner. Um, so I will try to my best to give you visuals whenever I can, friends. But zooxanthellae is a really special algae that lives inside of coral itself. Hmm, why is that algae so special is the next question, right? So that zooxanthellae that lives within the coral, that's what's getting in uh, all those nutrients from the water that coral needs to survive. That's what's getting all the sunlight nutrients to get coral to survive. And it's really working about 60% of the system that coral is. So when the water's really nice, it's healthy, it's at the right temperature, the algae is living in this coral, taking in all those nutrients, and you have beautiful, flourishing, healthy coral reefs. However, conditions can change and conditions have been changing within our ocean. The water has been getting warmer, but it's not as healthy as it was before and that little algae doesn't like it. And the reason why that's really problematic is because if the algae isn't healthy, if the algae isn't happy, the algae will actually just leave the coral reef. And when that happens, there's no nutrients running through the coral anymore. Coral can't survive on its own. Because if 60% of what was getting all the nutrients through it disappear, you can't survive on 40% power. These little coral polyps can't do it on their own. So when that happens, the coral begins to die. So this gives you an idea as to how important that algae is and that relationship with these different little coral polyps is because it's what's helping them survive. So another thing to kind of think about as to how our ocean is changing and as to how that impacts these different ecosystems. Um, and coral is one very big one. 
Um, but there are a few different things going on out in the world as we try to help corals. One thing is just learning more about corals. So you tuning in today and being able to learn more about corals, asking questions, thinking about different things is one way that we can keep these corals in our minds and make them a part of our everyday conversation. Because animals especially will use corals in lots of different ways. So we've learned coral is an animal. There's a really special algae known as zooxanthellae that lives inside of it, which is what's keeping it alive. So now I want to highlight some animals as to how do animals use corals. I want to give you a couple of seconds so you can think about it, and we'll go back to our tropical camera we are looking at, um, just so you can also observe potentially how different animals are using the different corals within our exhibits here. So let's see what we can take a look at um, within that exhibit. Um, as well. And if you have any thoughts as to how animals are going to be using those coral reefs, you can also send them in to our live text line that we have on the screen right here. So let's take a look at our camera. So here we go. We are back in our tropical reef exhibit that we have. And you can see all of these different animals in here. They'll start to move very shortly. Let's see. Um, one second, friends. Okay, here we have a different exhibit, and this exhibit is perfectly fine as well, um, since we have some different animals in here. So let's take a look at the animals. Take a look at as to how they're going through the coral, what they're doing. So does this give you any ideas as to how animals are using coral? So one big one that might be pretty obvious is that animals are using corals as their home, right? They'll find different corals that they can live in and everything. One other way I think about a coral reef is a coral reef is a mixture of permanent homes and of hotels. There's some fishes or some animals in general, not necessarily, they don't necessarily have to be fish. They'll find a coral and they're like, this is my forever home. This is where I'm going to be living. This is going to be my favorite little coral. This is where I'm going to come to sleep. This is where I'm going to come to drop off my food or other things that I find. But there's other animals who are like, hmm, I'm only going to stay in this coral reef for two months because then I'm going to swim and migrate to somewhere else. Um, so they'll be a temporary citizen within the coral reef. So it's like a little hotel. They'll check in. They'll hang out there. They'll eat or do the things day to day until they're like, goodbye. It's not my season to be here anymore. And they'll go. There's also other animals like great white sharks that use coral reefs almost as a gas station is how I think about it. Is that they're on a really long migration and they're like, hmm, I'm hungry. Let me stop at this coral reef. Let me fill up. Let me rest a little bit and then I'll be on my way. So that gives you an idea as to how some animals will live in coral reefs year round. How some of them will only live there during a couple of months or how some of them will just stop by for a couple of days, a couple of hours and then they'll keep on going on their merry way. So home is one way. The second way, which I mentioned with like great white sharks, is that they're going to be eating within these coral reefs. A lot of animals depend on these corals and these coral reefs to get their nutrients. And that whether it be them eating the coral itself or whether that be them eating the animals that are found within the different coral reefs. It's just a cycle of the food web, the cycle of life um, that's really, really important for us to be able to maintain. The third one is to hide away from predators. You'll notice there's lots of different sizes of fishes. There's lots of different colors and everything. And a lot of these fish are going to be very, very colorful so they can camouflage with the coral. Have you heard that word before? Camouflage. What does that mean? So if you're saying it helps them blend in with their surroundings, you're absolutely right. There's some animals in the coral reef. Look at your pinky. There's some animals in the coral reef that are, are the size of your pinky or even smaller. So imagine being a little small pinky sized animal living in the coral reef. You have to be able to hide really quickly in case a big animal swims on by. So that's how their colors and their size can help them. And that's how corals can help them in general. The last and final one is animals are going to be using their coral reefs to have their babies. These corals you can see are all different shapes, all different sizes. Look at this one right here specifically. 
this one would be a really great one for a fish to be like, hmm, I'm going to lay my eggs here. And it's just going to shoot its little eggs like, whoop, 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 inside the little coral. And then that dome shape of the coral is going to protect its eggs until those babies are ready to hatch. And then their parent can sh either show them how to grow and swim around. Or sometimes there are other types of fish guardians that will just leave and the baby will have to figure it out. In the animal world, friends, I always like to say there's all different types of guardians just like there is in the human world. Some of them will stick around and teach their young little babies to grow up, how to eat and everything. But more often than not, a lot of ocean animals will lay an egg, will have their baby, and they'll be like, see you never. And they'll go ahead and leave. They don't even remember what or who their baby was um, at that point anymore. So different situations that baby animals can face out in the ocean, um, which is another really interesting thing. But those are the four basic essential ways that animals are going to be using these coral reefs. And really, this applies to mostly every habitat, whether it be the kelp forest, the deep sea, seagrasses, wetlands, whatever thing you want to categorize, um, is that animals are dependent on these different habitats as their home, as a food source to have their babies and to hide away from predators. That's going to apply to most habitats across the board. So you can always keep that in mind. You can write it down if you want, if you ever want to reference that as just a quick note as to how animals are using these different ecosystems that we can find both in the ocean and on land as well. So now that we've spoken about how some animals use these coral reefs, I want to take a little bit of a deeper look into some specific animals. Um, so I'm going to let my friend Morgan, who is helping me here today, put whatever animal she wants up on the screen. Let's see what observations we can make about it. Ooh, do you recognize this fish? This is a butterfly fish. So what observations can you make on the butterfly fish? One. You can see it's very colorful, right? It has this nice, bright yellow color, even has some like neon yellow on some of its other fins, some black coloration. What about its body shape? It's a little bit different than other fish that you might imagine. One exercise I love doing, friends, is if you're ever curious as to what your brain thinks about, is close your eyes, and if I say the word fish, what do you imagine? We're looking at this fish, so you might have imagined this fish. But let's say, close your eyes and I say the word shark. What shark do you imagine? I feel like our brains sometimes have certain things that they imagine. So looking at different types of animals can really challenge some of the notions that our brains already have. So looking at a fish like this, maybe it's not the type of fish you would think about because it's a little bit of a different fish, right? From its body shape, it's kind of rectangular over here, but it goes down to this little straw mouth. You can see its fins are also a little bit different from the back fins to the side fins. But what the great thing about making observations is, friends, is even if you were to look at this fish and not know what necessarily this fish is, is if you look at, it, if you look at its different body parts, where its mouth is placed, how its fins look, it can tell you a lot about that fish. So looking at its mouth to start off with, it has a very skinny straw-like mouth. Do you think this fish is opening its mouth up super gigantic to eat really big things? Or do you think its mouth can only open a little bit and it'd be eating small things? It's going to be eating small things, right? It's not going to open up this mouth and unhinge its jaw and open it up to be gigantic. Same animals, I will say, can do that, but not too many. Um, but this one's going to be eating really small things. It's like a little straw-like mouth. They'll find little shrimps, little things floating around and they go... They're going to be eating like that. If you've ever seen a video of a seahorse eating, or if you've ever read about it in a book or anything like that, their diets are very similar and the way that they eat is very similar. So it's going to be eating things floating around. And this animal is going to be one of our more permanent residents within the coral reef. They're not really going to be leaving to go to different areas of the ocean. They're going to be spending most of their lives within close by coral reefs, if not the same coral reef in general. Um, so that's why you can see that coloration on its body. But it also has a very special adaptation. Have you heard that word before? Have you heard the word adaptation before? Say it with me. Adaptation. So what does that word mean? So first, I want to go ahead and give us a visual of that word. 
Ooh, here we go. So here we have the word adaptation with fish friend. Oh, here we go. Our old fish friend was back. So here we have a visual, the word adaptation. So what does that word mean? I'll give you a couple of seconds so you can think about it. And if you want to text it into us, you can as well. So the way that I think about an adaptation is something special that an animal has that helps it survive. So an adaptation helps an animal survive, be healthy, and live till the end of its life without being eaten, essentially. So an adaptation that this butterfly fish has is known as a false eye spot. So I want to give you a second. Where is the eye on this fish located? Did you find its eye? I found its eye. <gasps> Wait, no, that's its false eye spot. Its actual eyeball is right here. But this is a false eye spot. Why do you think having a false eye is something that may help this fish? I will let you know a lot of animals have false eye spots from whales to tigers to land animals. A lot of them have false eye spots. Why do you think that can help them? Look at the size of these eyes, right? So compare its real eye to the false eye spot. Which one's bigger? The false eye spot is. So the reason why that's helpful is let's say what could maybe eat this. I don't know if this is accurate, friends. Um, but let's say there's a sea lion, right? And the sea lion's like, hmm, I'm looking for food today. A sea lion is also like 20 times the size of this. So imagine that as well. And it's like, hmm, what can I eat today? And it's looking at this fish, but it sees this really big eye. And it's like, huh, that looks like a really big fish because it's a really big eye. And it's like, not today. And it's going to swim away. So then after that, this fish gets to live another day because its false eye spot tricked the predator. So you can see this is something helpful to a lot of animals, but especially to some of these smaller coral reef fish are adaptations just like this. There's also other fish like um, one of my favorite fish is the a damsel fish um, that will have even more intricate patterns all over its body. Um, it has blue and yellow, all these different colors all over its body, and that will help it blend in and trick predators too. But I want to talk to you about one very specific fish since I want to explore the topic of animals being able to eat out in the coral reef, and maybe even more specifically being able to eat coral. So we're going to visit one of our other exhibits, which is our coral predators exhibit. So when I say the word predator, what do you imagine? Because even this fish here is a predator. And this other fish, spoiler alert, that we're going to be looking at is also a predator that is able to eat coral. Have you ever heard of an animal eating coral? Do you think coral is really hard? Or do you think coral is really soft? Or do you think it depends on the type of coral? It depends on the type of coral. I do want to let you know, though, a lot of coral is going to be pretty, pretty hard. So what type of fish do you think is eating this coral? Let's see if we can take a closer look and or if we can find our fish. Ooh, right on cue, kind of. He's right here. This is our parrotfish. Of course, it's swimming away now. I feel like whenever I specifically talk about this parrotfish, it knows and it likes to swim away. But we have a total of seven to nine of them within this exhibit. The number's always changing, friends. But I think about seven to nine. But this is our largest one that we saw just swim on by. Let's wait and see if he decides to return or not right now. But you can see there's lots of different animals within this exhibit as well. But the parrotfish is one who will be eating coral. So with that being said, do you think the coral within this exhibit is real or do you think it's artificial? Do you think we would be looking at any coral in the exhibit if it was real? No. If, it, if this was real coral, the parrotfish would have definitely ate it. And here we go. You can see how beautiful that parrotfish is. But for that reason, we use artificial coral in here and in the majority of our exhibits. If we were to use real coral, that could be really devastating to the ocean if we were to take that much coral out. And also, it would be really, 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 really hard to take care of. 
So because of that, we use artificial coral. The animals don't seem to know, and if they know, they don't seem to care. And that's what's important to us. If they're still using it in those four regular ways, we're, well, three out of the four, because we don't want anyone eating artificial coral of those ways that we were talking about. So this parrotfish, when we first got him, he kind of looked at the coral, he didn't munch on it, and he was like, oh, that's not real. And now we supply him with food in different ways. He eats lettuce, little jaw molds that kind of taste like coral. We shape them like coral. But out in the ocean, he would be munching on coral as well as other parrotfish. So their mouths have a very similar beak-like structure to birds, which is why they're known as parrotfish. And those beak-like structures that they have are very, very strong. So let me show you a close-up of these corals that I have here on my Explorer camera. So you can get an idea as to what these corals look like and some of their structures. So these are four different types of corals that we have here. Let me try and fix this lighting a little bit for us. Okay. One second, friend. Mm. Okay, hopefully this looks good on your screens. So you can see some of the different structures that corals have here. And it gives you an idea as to how hard it is. So let's zoom in to one first. So you can see all these different little ridges on it, and I'll focus right now. And it's very, very hard. I don't know how well you can hear it. Let me put my microphone next to it. You can hear it. It's very, very hard. If you're ever out in the ocean as well, friends, if you're ever visiting somewhere tropical, or maybe you're tuning in from somewhere that coral is very local to you, just make sure to never touch coral, friends, because it's very sensitive. The coral that we have here has been given to us, um, so we're able to teach with it and everything, but it is illegal for anyone to go out and grab coral, especially because of the very hard times corals are going through. But you can get an idea for all these different structures and shapes. So this parrotfish is able to come on by, and oftentimes they'll eat pieces of corals that have fallen off the reefs, and they'll munch on them, and they'll eat them. What happens next is really special. They poop. <laughs> but why is their poop special? So the way that this parrotfish is able to eat this coral, digest it, and then poop, it's not just pooping out poop like ours. It's pooping out white sand. So as it poops out this white sand, have you ever been to a white sand beach? Have you ever seen pictures of one? Have you ever seen one in a movie? Maybe a white sand beach is somewhere that you have on your bucket list, if it's something you want to do within your lifetime. You're walking on parrotfish poop. Hmm, I think it's really cool. I know walking on poop may not be the most exciting thing, but as long as you don't eat it, it's very, very cool. As far as I know, it doesn't smell either. Um, but these fish, are creating places where we can visit, which I think is one of the most fascinating things is that we have a lot of man-made places, right? Your home, a lot of the buildings within our cities, all of those are man-made, human-made, sorry. Um, but from there, there's also places that these animals create and these different environments that they create that we are still able to go out and enjoy. So that's something just super, super interesting to think about. I do see friends. I have been chatting for a while, though, and we're actually at the end of our program. I want to say thank you so much for tuning in today, friends, especially as we learn more about coral reefs um, as to how we can protect them. And one way, like I mentioned, is talking about them. If you have any additional questions, you can also feel free to text us. You can feel free to use our email, and we can give you some um, more, some more resources on coral. We also also have a worksheet available on our activity list with our Summer Kids Club website, which is on the Aquarium of the Pacific, where you can access more resources as to how you can learn more about coral and all these different magnificent animals that live within these reefs. Like I mentioned, though, Summer Kids Club will continue through Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, so you can continue to tune in at 9, 10, and 11 a.m. for lots of different programs to tell you tomorrow Tomorrow we are doing moving and grooving at 9 a.m. So if you want to get up and move that body and get your morning stretches, you can. At 10 a.m., 
we're going to do a bilingual sea turtle class so that will be with me if you want to learn more about sea turtles and then at 11 tomorrow we will be exploring the kelp forest which will be great as today you learned about the coral reef on that note friends once again thank you so much for joining me and i hope you have a good rest of your day goodbye